Today's episode is sponsored by our good friends at Famous Faces and Funnies, located in Melbourne, Florida. Check out their Facebook Live auctions on great deals on back issues, action figures, and cards. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Codename New to Vero 2. Hi, I'm your presenter, Shabu. Are you? Well, this is our monthly pickup episode where I kind of review the things that I picked up during last month and also kind of a preview of what our regulars can expect going forward in this upcoming month of February 2023. Of course, we have our PGX and EGS unboxing episodes, but the bread and butter of this channel has always been recapping the IDW G.I. Joe run. And with G.I. Joe being on hiatus, I thought it'd be an excellent time to explore other iconic 80s fran or Gen X franchises. And we're going to kick off with Transformers issue number one from the Marvel run. Um, so that issue is probably going to drop in the next day or two. This is not the uh, original one, the the one I have is graded and it's up there right now. But again, this is IDW's reprints like they did with G.I. Joe and their one shots. They did the same treatment for iconic uh, G1 Transformers Marvel run issues. And I had to pick up this cover. I'm going to say it in that video as well. I gravitated to this cover because of the toys that are featured on it. I mean, how badass is that? You have Optimus and Megatron. Uh, on the cover of this issue. And um, again, it's beautifully done using that higher quality paper that I talked about in the G.I. Joe one shots. Um, it's just a nice, clean and crisp pages. I, these are great investments. These are just all around wonderful options. I mean, you don't, especially when I was talking about the G.I. Joe, you get issue 21, you get 26, 27, the origin of Snake Eyes, uh, all the yearbooks got the same treatment. And even though like I have or any collector may have the original ones, these reprints, and I said it in the last uh, EGS unboxing, they are excellent options uh, for those that love comics for the right reasons, not the monetary aspect and all that, oh, 9.8, CGC, all that stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong, but the essence of what comics did for us as Gen Xers or, you know, how it molded us as adults and stuff. That's what these, I think, reprints recapture. And that's why we're going to take a look at this one. And it's long overdue. And the interesting is like, unlike G.I. Joe, I wasn't regular with the Transformers. I would pick up issues here and there. But as a continued story, um, I didn't follow. and. Um, You'll also see in on our, one of our future unboxings, I actually picked up the three-issue Transformers the Movie um, comic books, which I think is way overlooked. And there's some key first appearances, obviously, um, with Scourge, Galvatron, uh, Unicron. I mean, so many key first appearances that, that's been flying below the radar. So you're gonna, I'm going to say in that episode as well, look and pick up the Transformers the movie comics. Those are really good value, good future, quote unquote, uh, things to add to your personal collection. So without further ado, let's dive in and take a look at the com other comic books I picked up during last month. Of course, I'd like to thank this episode's sponsor, Famous Faces and Funnies, located in Melbourne, Florida. Now they opened up another store in South Florida by Riviera Beach. So they have two locations. And again, even if you're not local, they have these Facebook live auctions where you get great deals on back issues, action figures, toys. Um, it's amazing. And the best thing is that they ship first class in the lower 48 states. And a lot of people, I'm surprised, a lot of people have messaged me that taken advantage because when you think about it florida is a great market that hey if you're in oklahoma and you're looking for voltron chances are famous faces 
has it because we've got to remember, you know, mom and pop retire in Florida and they'll have truckloads of little Jimmy and Susie shit and they don't know what to do with it. So Famous Faces kind of takes it from them and offers it to other collectors. So it's an untapped uh, market that you guys should take advantage of and a lot of people have already done so. So check them out on their Facebook page. The link will be down below. Now let's get to the pickups. Alrighty, so let's start off this episode with the bang, and I truly mean that in this case. So we're going to look at the variant cover of Jim Balin's Catwoman, issue number 49. Now, DC asked Jim to come back and do this variant cover, which is significant because when you think about it, the, uh, Jim's portrayal of Catwoman is the definitive Catwoman in my opinion, uh, when you close your eyes and picture the character, I picture the 1990s Jim Balin run of Catwoman. I've said it previously on other episodes and so many times, you know, when you come back into comics, you kind of re read stuff that you kind of blew past when you were a kid in the 90s. And Jim Balin's Catwoman run along with uh, uh, John Byrne's uh, She-Hulk run are two things that I kind of went back and found an appreciation as an adult reader. I think that they were wonderfully done. And I've said it a million times, Jim rightfully belongs in the same tier as the Jim Lees, the Todd McFarlane's, the Rob Liefeld, all those 90 guys, Jim should have been included amongst those. But due to personal disagreements and views, Jim decided to go his own way and created Broadsword Comics, where he puts out Tarot Witch of the Black Road, which I've showcased on previous pickup episodes on this channel. But this book, I really was interested. It's kind of slightly paying homage to the Catwoman number one that I've uh, done a, a comic book grading unboxing. Um, I love that uh, cover, and I think this one fills right in and i think there's a oh here's another one real quick this is issue number two and i think i talked about it so issue number two i mean you, his portrayal of catwoman is absolutely amazing so um to get this and um it's definitely something that i was really interested in picking up and it's a beautifully done book his lines his colors his shapes, everything that he does to portray the character, I think is spot on. And, um, you know, obviously it's not bad looking either. So Catwoman issue number 49, the Jim Balin cover. And with that, it jumps into his regular run, which we have talked about in other pickup episodes. And that is the new Tarot Witch of the Black Rose, issue number 137. Again, the same things that I talked about with the Catwoman. Jim just does a wonderful job at this fantasy world of swords and sorcery, demons, uh, witchcraft, all this other stuff. It may be scary, but I love this shit. I mean, plus it's not bad looking too. What I like about Jim's artwork and his books is you get two covers. So the one in the front and then his back. So in all the issues we do, the, and my regulars know this, it's just um, comics about fantasy, you know, sometimes, but it's just how he does this. Is, and the stories are actually really fun. I enjoy these stories. Um, it's not just eye candy. It's actually pretty good stories as well. So Catwoman, number 49, and Tarot, Witch of the Black Rose, number 137. The next batch we're going to look at is going to be the amazing spider-man and again you know i talked about it last month i don't know what i guess i'm kind of far behind with the is amazing spider-man bi-monthly because uh i missed quite a bit of books since the last time i was there i mean what the hell well maybe it's because of the dark web uh storyline that's going along and i talked about it um where Ben Riley is back and he's taking on the villain Chasm, uh, kind of trying to get rid of Peter Parker so he could get his memories back. So it's, and then he's teaming up with um, Madeline Pryor, 
who is the uh, um, clone of Jean Grey. So it's like all the clones, plus they recruited Venom of all people to come in and kind of make trouble for their um, original counterparts and also wreak havoc and um, kind of blend, you know, I think Mephisto is going to pop up too. So this storyline, it, it remains to be seen uh, if it's going to hit. So far, I, you know, there's been some pluses and minuses. I think there's an introduction of uh, a new character as well. So um, like Ben Riley's girlfriend takes on it. So there's going to be a first appearance. Whether these characters stick, I don't know. Um, I picked up mainly in this volume of Amazing Spider-Man. Remember, when it goes back to number one, even though it's issue number, what, uh, 900 or... Yeah, 900 was issue number six. You know, I don't, this stupid naming convention is messing me up. But it, I, don't, I picked up this series because of John Romita Jr. And Spider-Man and John, Marie, Marie, John Romita Jr., excuse me, I, I, you know, you can't pass that combination up because John Romita and Spider-Man, he just does such a wonderful job. And check out our good friend Comic Troves when he talks about the artwork of John Romita Jr. I think that's a really good episode and kind of echoes what I'm trying to express to you guys. But so far, this has kind of been, you don't know yet. It, I mean, even though we're like, what? 17 18 issues in i still don't know what the fuck like if i like it or not and i hope it's not like a clone saga shit and where you're you know you just keeps going and going and, and it keeps dragging along i mean i was out of uh comics when this clone saga came that's more of a 90s thing but at the same time like you know i went back and again it's a clusterfuck and i just i'm afraid that this is the path that this rendition of Spider-Man is going. Does it have potential? Yes. Is the artwork by John Romita great? Yes. But at the same time, the storyline itself is like, I'm often conflicted with it. And that's the tough part about reading Amazing Spider-Man to me. It's just like, like I'm not jazzed up to read these. As you can see, like there's a lot of them. And I just kind of let them pile up. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And that, that's what's bothering me about this current run of Amazing Spider-Man. Anyway, if you've been reading it, let me know what your thoughts are about Amazing Spider-Man. If it's something that I need to plow through to get to the meat and potatoes of it. Let me know. The next book we're going to take a look at is The New Lady Death. Again, this is the first issue and Lady Death is kind of like one or two, and then one or two, and then it's a new, it's like every two issues, it's another chapter, if that makes sense. So you kind of have, it's not like one to 10, it's one or two, boom, then the next chapter is two, three issues, boom, then he starts another, but it's the same story, keep, keep going, you just have to get all of them to kind of put them together. It's a new way of numbering and reading a storyline, but if you're coming in the middle of the story, I don't know if that's good. But uh, that's why the omnibuses and stuff, or the trade paperback for Lady Death is often preferred. But the artwork itself is phenomenal. Um, I think that the, the, the same thing I was saying about Jim Balin, um, this is just a beautiful cover. So, yeah, Brian Polito does just does a great job with this. And the stories are actually good. I mean, they're, they're not bad at all. And the same re reason why I recommend uh, Tarot Witch of the Black Rose, I'll say the same thing with Lady Death. And, th again, these are, like, not the normal regular run stuff. And I've been doing this for a while, and I kind of like that, you know, it just – I could pick up a Batman, I could pick up whatever, but at the same time, like for the pure enjoyment of reading comics, that's why I like these weird titles. And the next one, of course, is my gal, the next Elvira in Horrorland, issue number five. I've never seen this photo before, so my regulars know that I collect the photo variants of, of the Elvira series, whether it was Mistress of the Dark, Shape of Elvira, 
Avira meets Vincent Price. So this is the latest one, Avira in Horrorland, where she kind of goes through all the iconic horror. And it's a great story. Uh, these have been fun, fun, fun to read, and I really enjoy them. David Avalon, and I've said it a million times, fully captures the essence of Elvira, and it feels like she's actually saying these things and actually going through these things. That's the mark of a good writer. So kudos to him. And these are fun, fun books that, that I've been enjoying. Light, offbeat, quirky, right up that alley of why Elvira is a legend, iconic classic. So Elvira in Horrorland, number five. The last book we're going to take a look at is something that, you know, I've been saying that with G.I. Joe and well, on hiatus, uh, one of the things we're going to do in this channel is recap other Gen X 80s franchises. Like I said, Transformers issue number one will drop in a day or two. And I'm going to do the Voltron issue number one. Also, I can't neglect He-Man Masters of the Universe. So I picked up, I think this is his uh, second or maybe like, I know it's his first of his ongoing series, but this is one of the first early appearances of He-Man himself. And uh, there's one of the star and then there's that his real first appearances when he f goes up against Superman and who is the strongest in the entire universe. That's his actual first appearances. And that's been spiking up with the, I think Amazon is doing a live action rendition of, so we all saw all that Kevin Smith spike, you know, for that, then it dropped and it was a Kevin Smith production. Kind of the values of them drop, tapered down a little bit, which was a good time to pick up these key He-Man issues. But now with the Amazon um, live action series, news and speculations and, you know, planning, the He-Man thing is spiked. You know, He-Man is always going like this. It's been for the last seven or eight years. So since the lull hit, I picked this up. And this was a good, smart pickup for me because, hey, you might not get the actual first appearances. But like I've said in this channel, getting the first of a series, like Wolf, the Frank Miller um, Wolverine issue number one, and also second appearances are good value and still captures the fun. So Masters of the Universe issue number one to tempt the gods. That is a good pickup that I'm happy about. The next thing I'm going to showcase is pretty big. And I mean big. That's right. The HasLab Sky Striker. So I was one of the ones that backed the project. And uh, what sold me is the fact that Northrop Grumman, the people that make the F-14, this is officially licensed by them. So the original Sky Striker was not. Not that it matters, but, you know, me with my background in government auditing, working in a lot of the aviation facilities. You know, my uncle worked at Boeing helicopter, or he still does work at Boeing helicopters, where I got to see the Chinook, uh, the, you know, saw the prototype of the Comanche, and then the Offspring. I love aerospace. I mean, I can't fly, I'm too short to be in a cockpit, but still, you know, Top Gun, Maverick, all that stuff. And man, does this, Opening this box, I felt like I was eight years old again to see this iconic box cover, uh, to see this, to hold this, the colors, everything. Um, you know, I have my issues with Emily, um, the G.I. Joe marketing director. I think she's the worst. Uh, you know, she doesn't, she's a Mighty Morphin Power Rangers fan, and she's treated me like shit. Like, you know, uh, well... IDW team treats me nicely. Larry Hammer treats me lightly, nicely. Emily has just been, you know, stuck up snob. I'm saying it right now, and I'm not afraid to say it. So, fuck you, Emily. But anyway, anyway the this is just a wonderfully done. And look at that, just a wonderful box. It's just really cool. And of course, the figures. If you see back there. You got one, two, three, four, five, six figures included in this in this HasLab project. 
I know there's been a shitload of unboxing videos. I'm not the first to do one, but um, again, some of those guys are just, you know, bandwagon jumping. Where we've done GI Joe content since 2015, HCC is going to do one, and uh, of course that's the one I highly recommend everybody to watch. And, you know, he's just the best toy reviewer ever. And speaking of toys, we got the next Tiger Force Rakondo. Rakondo, um, one of my favorite figures. I enjoy him so much. Uh, here's my Rakondo. So we're going to do a quick video of the Rakondo G.I. Joe Classifieds Tiger Force. And uh, even though in the box, this is beautiful. Like the everything about this figure, I absolutely love. And I, our good friends at uh, Simple Tricks and Nonsense, uh, John and Rebecca, um, John was telling me how he thought he always gave him an Australian accent because he's wearing that hat. But, you know. I think he's from Kansas or something like that. He's not from, <laughs> he's not Australian, but it's just kind of funny that we think he's Australian just because of that hat, but really he's American as apple pie. So Tiger Force Rakondo is going to be coming up, which brings me to the last thing I'm going to showcase. And that is Ayla Sikora's action figure. You know, I've said it a million times, my beef with modern day Star Wars, but like any 80s kid, this was our first love. Like you see this packaging, you see this artwork, you, you, you know, you just gravitate to it. You can't help yourself. A part of everything that we do as far as collectors and fans originated from this line. So you have to give yourself, you know, stop yourself and ask, is this worth it? And this was on clearance in Walmart, so it was five bucks. So, of course, it's a no brainer, like you know, with that. And plus, A.S. Sakura is one of my favorite Jedi's because you know, she's hot and she's also different. She didn't always wear the same things as Obi Wan or Anakin or whatever. And you know, her being killed in Felucia was, was like, oh no, out of all the Jedi's, I was so sad that she was killed in Order 66. But um, I have this figure as well as her um, Revenge of the Sith action figure. So two A-list of course, so I couldn't pass up on this one. And I'll say this, this was actually based off of the uh, Clone Wars shorts that came out in the early 2000s. I remember I used to download episodes on um, the Amazon, uh, what was it? Where was it? We used to go to Apple, not Amazon, Apple. Apple Store. So I used to go to the Apple Store and you should watch it in quick time videos, like each 15 minutes episode of that. And I think that is actually one of the things that's overlooked because their depiction of uh, General Grievous in those, he, General Grievous was a scary mofo, like, you know, not the goofy <coughs> thing that we see in the live action, but. Um, in that, Aya Sakura was bare, almost got killed by General Grievous. And same thing with Shock T. I mean, General Grievous took on five Jedis and almost killed them all. And he was that devastating. So her appearance in, the, in that Clone Wars shorts really, really cemented why I like this character a lot. So Aya Sakura. Alrighty, so that does it for this pickup videos. Hey, if there's anything that you want to recommend or suggest, um, let me know. I'm definitely open to pick up new things. And uh, but I thought this is just a fun way that we kicks off kickstart every month is to show what I picked up, you know, and you guys could discuss and decide if it's something you might be interested in adding to your personal collection. But above all, it's just fun to showcase and talk some shit. And this is Super Bowl weekend, so go birds. That's right. I am sick of Kansas City. Um, I don't like their colors. It's like ketchup and yellow mustard. It's like condiments. That's, that's what Kansas City looks like. So I'm going to be excited and fired up for my Eagles to win their second Super Bowl. Go birds. We'll see you next time. Have a good one.